نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من اهلي اللهم فكنا في الدين رب زدني علما اللهم اني اسالك علما نافعا رزقا طيبا وعملا متقبلا امين ثم امين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته today we will start our session from the discussion of uh, the chapter number 5 of surah al-baqarah verse 40 ഹാവസ്റ്റോഡ് and that i will fulfill your covenant from me and be afraid of only me now in this verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing a group of people a family is being addressed which family is it israel the children of israel Israel was the name of Hazrat Yaqub alayhi salam and uh, the meaning of Israel is an obedient slave or an obedient bondsman of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the offspring and the progeny of Hazrat Yaqub alayhi salam is being addressed and this family is very very frequently spoken of in Quran and they are addressed very frequently in quran <clears throat> so today i will give a basic introduction of the family and we will not be repeating the whole uh, discussion over and over again from hazrat ibrahim alay salam two main family trees they are discussed in quran and the two main family trees are bani israil and bani ismail bani israil hazrat uh, ibrahim alayhi salam we know he was the resident of iraq uh, 2100 years bc and uh, when he started speaking against the worshiping of idols uh, by the people of iraq he was um, taken enemy to and then he was thrown in fire and the fire he he escaped with the help of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he migrated from palestine from iraq to palestine and accompanied him hazrat sara and hazrat lut hazrat sara was uh, his paternal cousin and hazrat lut was his nephew and then he migrated to palestine he settled there and he married hazrat sara and hazrat ibrahim alayhi salam and hazrat sara in palestine they had a son hazrat ishaq alayhi salam and then his son was hazrat yaqub alayhi salam and the family tree which continued from hazrat yaqub alayhi salam has been called as bani israil now um, briefly explaining the story after hazrat yaqub alayhi salam he had uh, 12 sons 10 sons and uh, hazrat yusuf alayhi salam and his brother real brother hazrat bani amin alayhi salam hazrat yusuf alayhi salam and hazrat bani amin now after some time we also learn from surah yusuf that the 10 brothers they got envious and they threw hazrat yusuf alayhi salam in the well and he was taken out from there and he was sold as a slave and uh, then he reached egypt and finally over the years he finally became the king of egypt 
And uh, there, finally, when the brothers reached there to get food for themselves, they were um, finally asked by Hazrat Yusuf Salam, he asked his step brothers and his parents, that is the whole family, to come and settle to Egypt. And this is how the whole family of Bani Israel migrated from Palestine to Egypt. Now in Egypt, as long as they stayed connected to the teachings of Allah and the teachings of the Prophet, they had power, they, had, they were the rulers of the land of Egypt. But when they deviated from the teachings, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took away the power, took away the rule and imposed a nation over them. And the people of these Kipti people, they made them the slaves. And the rulers of the Kiptis were the Pharaoh. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and these people, they were very hard to them and they were very cruel to them and they punished them and they persecuted them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mercy on the people of Bani Israel. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. As the Musa alayhi salam was sent towards the family of Bani Israel again, and uh, with the help, once they again believed in the teachings of Allah and they obeyed Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, then finally they were released from the rulers and they were made to stay in a desert. And uh, then for a destined period, they stayed in the desert and finally they were asked to make jihad. And uh, they made jihad and they fought back the land of the prophets, Palestine, the Palestine, which was the homeland and the birthplace of the prophets was again acquired by the people of uh, Bani Israel. And when they again deviated, they were again punished by Allah. And uh, on account of this, they have been mentioned as the Maghdub. So the Maghdub were the followers of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, that is the Jews. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again blessed them with the prophethood of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam and the book of Injil. And they preferred to go astray despite receiving the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the book. And then they have been called the Christians, the followers of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, they have been called as Dualim. So now if I sum up, the whole events of Bani Israel, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Bani Israel, he is actually referring to the followers of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, that is the Jews, and they've been labeled as Maghdu in Quran. And uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the followers of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, the Christians, they have been referred as the Dualim. So, Talking about Bani Israel means referring to the Jews and the Christians. <clears throat> now, the second family tree started from Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam and Hazrat Hajra. And uh, they had a son, Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam. By the order of um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam left the mother and the son in the desert. The desert which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself mentions as Wadi Ghair Zizra, that it was a desert, it was a valley where there was no cultivation. And the mother and the son, the small young lactating infancy, in his infancy, the lactating child with the mother was left in this desert where there was no cultivation, there was not even a drop of water, no means of sustenance, no signs of life. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had asked Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam to leave the mother and the son there because it was intended that Allah's house, Baytullah, was to be constructed here. And uh, here with Allah's blessings, the mother and the son, they survived and the family tree which followed them. They were the residents of Makkah and they were the family of Bani Ismail. After Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam in this family tree, totally contrary to the Bani Israel, there was no book sent and there was no prophet sent for the next 2,500 years. 
full 40 generations passed. And then Prophet was um, chosen in the family of Bani Israel. And then he was also made as the seal of prophets. So if I repeat the summary of the two families, Hazrat Ibrahim and Hazrat Sarah, they settled in Palestine and the family tree which started from this, from these two was Bani Israel. And they were blessed with a chain of and a series of prophets and a series of the holy books. And the second family tree, Hazrat Ibrahim and Hazrat Hajra. Hazrat Hajra and her son, Hazrat Ismail, they settled in Mecca. And the family tree which started from them was the Bani Ismail. And this family tree had just two prophets, Hazrat Ismail, and then 2,500 years, full 40 generations after Hazrat Ismail, they were blessed with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they were just given, this family tree was just given one holy book, the book of Quran. So whenever Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala talks about Bani Israel, it means the Jews and the Christians. And when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is talking about Bani Ismail, it is referring to the whole of the family tree of Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam in Makkah. So now here Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is addressing Bani Israel and is asking them to do or is ordering them to do certain things. Allah is ordering to, uh, them to do what? Allah is saying that remember, remember and mention my blessings on you. What blessings were the Bani Israel blessed with? Allah had blessed Bani Israel with, with lots of blessings. You know, there was a chain of prophets. As Allah says, وَقَفَّيْنَا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ بِرْغُسُلْ Prophets and messengers, and at times even two prophets, and even times when there were three prophets at a time, and then there were the divine scriptures and the holy books, they were a source of guidance, and then there were other bounties which I shall be talking about in the next few chapters, but they were blessed. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them realize the bounties they had and then ask them to do what? Number one, to remember Allah. Number two, to be grateful to Allah, to mention and to acknowledge the blessings of Allah and to fulfill the covenants of Allah. And, uh, and then in return, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised that if you fulfill covenants of Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill the covenants which Allah has made with the people of Pan Israel. And then the fourth thing which Allah ordered them after uh, making them and after reminding them of their blessings was just to fear Allah and fear none other than Allah. Verse number 41. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still talking to the people of Bani Israel and Allah says, وَآمِنُوا بِمَا أَنزَلْتُ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا مَعَكُمْ وَلَا تَكُونُوا أَوَّلَ قَافِرٍ بِهِ وَلَا تَشْتُرُوا بِآيَاتِ ثَمَنًا قَلِيلًا وَإِيَّايَ فَاتَّقُونِي And believe in what I have sent down, confirming that which is already with you, and be not the first to disbelieve in it, and do not exchange my signs for a small price and fear only me. Now in this verse 41, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting the Jews to have faith in the prophethood of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to have faith and belief in the holy book. That is Quran given to Prophet Now, for inviting them to accept the truth of Quran, Allah is saying that Quran is what? That Quran, the book 
which Prophet Salawalisam has been revealed, is a book that confirms what is with them. That is, Quran confirms what is in Torah and Injil. What does this mean? How does Quran confirm the Torah and Injil? This is so in the following ways. Number one, according to Quran and according to the teachings of Quran, belief in the prophets and belief in the books. These are the two articles of belief and faith. And these two articles of belief, that is belief in the prophets and in the uh, belief in the books, they have, it has to be perfected for the perfection of faith. And for the perfection of these two articles of faith, Quran explains that, that all the believers have to have faith and belief in not only Prophet Sallallahu but in all the prophets before him also. And all the people just have, who have faith or who are the believers, they are supposed to believe in Quran and the holy books and the divine scriptures which were revealed before Quran. As Allah said in Surah Baqarah, Yu'minuna bima unzila ilayka wa ma unzila min qablika. So this is one manner in which Quran confirms the previous divine scriptures. The second thing is that Quran very frequently talks about them. Quran mentions the Torah and the Injil and the divine scriptures, so for Ibrahim, Abba Musa, and then frequently talks about them and mentions them. So this, in another way, is musaddiq al-lima ma'akum. And the third thing is that in the teachings, the teachings, the orders, the laws, the do's, the don'ts, the rules, the regulations, the halal, the haram, mentioned in Quran are exactly similar to what were mentioned in Torah, and they were mentioned in Injil. So the orders and the teachings of Quran are similar to the teachings of the books of the people of the book. So now after inviting the Jews and Christians to accept and to believe the Quran, Allah has ordered them not to disbelieve in the teachings of Quran. Allah also orders the people of the previous books to avoid trading with um, the worldly gains in exchange of the verses of Quran. And uh, then in this word, uh, verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has again repeated what? That just fear Allah and solely Allah. Verse number 42. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then again here orders, وَلَتَّلْ بِسُوا الْحَقَّ بِالْبَاطِلِ وَتَقْتُمُوا الْحَقَّ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ that do not mix the truth with falsehood or conceal the truth while you know it. Now in this verse number 42, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered the people of Bani Israel, that is the Jews and the Christians, to refrain from two things. Number one, mixing up, jumbling up all what is truth and what is false. And second thing is to conceal what is the truth, knowingly. Now, what is this all about? To understand this, we need to understand the background of uh, Bani Israel. Now, you know that Bani Israel, despite being blessed with a chain of prophets and with a series of holy books, they they kept on deviating from the teachings of Allah and from the orders of the prophets. So when they deviated from the teachings of uh, their prophet and the teachings of Allah, which they were given in their divine scriptures, then Allah would punish them. Allah would punish them because of their disobedience. And then Allah would deprive them of their power, of their rule, of their authorities and his blessings and then they were oppressed. In their books, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the prophethood and the arrival of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given, gave them clear indications of the prophethood and the arrival of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So you know what happened, what used to happen was they used to pray for the arrival of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they had been waiting for the arrival of mercy of the worlds. And they used to even announce when they were oppressed and when they were made slaves and when they were punished and when they were persecuted by the tyrant rulers, they used to announce. They used to announce and they used to highlight to their cruel rulers that, you know, once our prophet comes, then we will be victorious and our conditions will be changed and we will no longer be oppressed. But actually what happened was that when Prophet Sallallahu was chosen as the prophet, what happened was, was totally against what they expected and what they desired. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was chosen as a prophet in the family of Bani Ismail. He was chosen in the second family tree. Although they had common ancestors, but they were disappointed and they were demoralized. And in fact, not only that, they were even furious as to why that Prophet was chosen in the family of Bani Israel and the family of Bani Israel was left out. They were not blessed with the prophethood of Prophet in this state of affairs, they got envious and they got jealous. And all these negative emotions of envy, of jealousy, of disappointment, of anger and fury, they developed a negative frame of mind, a negative outlook. And they, they got enemies with Prophet Wasallam. And because of all this negative attitude and a negative frame of mind and a negative outlook, despite recognizing Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they failed to accept and they refused to have faith and believe in him and his book. Not only this, they became bitter enemies of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they became extremely hostile and they became opponents of the Quran. That is why they have been asked here to believe in the Prophet and to believe in Quran. And another situation that developed was that when Prophet announced his prophethood and he invited the people of Makkah towards faith. Now in this family of Bani Ismail, since the last 20, 2,500 years, there had been no prophet and they had had no holy guidance. They had not received any holy book. So since they were deprived of any form of holy guidance, they uh, had, since they had not arrived, they had not received any form of holy book or holy scripture, they were finding it difficult to realize and to understand the truth of the teachings by Prophet Sallallahu And they were finding it difficult to have faith in the book of the Prophet Sallallahu So what they used to do was these people of Makkah and these mushrikeen of Makkah they used to come over to the Jews and they used to come over to the people of the book and they used to talk to them and they used to say that, you know what, you are the people of the holy book. You have the holy scriptures and you can relate and you can comprehend and you can understand the truth of the teachings of Prophet Sallallahu and his book much better than us. And you confirm to us, you verify to us that what your books say about him and about his Quran, that these people of Makkah and the Mushrikeen in Makkah, they used to go to the Christians and they used to go to the Jews for the reconfirmation of the truth of the teachings of Quran and the prophethood of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they used to say that you read the holy books and uh, what do your books say about 
what Prophet is teaching us or is saying or what he is telling. Are these verses which Prophet is presenting, are they of a divine source? Now, to all these queries of the Mushrikeen of Mecca, despite knowing all the truth, the Jews and the Christians, they used to conceal and they used to tell them that their books had no confirmation of the Prophet وسلم, or Quran. So it is this falsehood they have been asked to stop from. They've been asked that you have faith and belief your so yourself. And when people come to you reconfirming about the teachings of Prophet وسلم, then do not mix the truth with falsehood and do not conceal, although you have yourself understood the truth of all this yourself. Verse number 43, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders, Akimu salata wa atu zakata wa ma And you yourself do what? You establish prayers and you give zakah and bow down with all those who bow in worship and obedience. Verse 43, the points what we are gathering from the verse is that the order of Salah is not just offering up Salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is here ordering about Salah. But the order of the Salah, I again repeat, as I have, as I have already explained in the previous chapters of Surah Baqarah, order of Salah is just not about offering of Salah. It is what? It is about the establishing of Salah. And then we can also relate that the order of Salah and Zakat was also given for the previous uh, for, to the previous prophets and was also made obligatory for the followers of the previous prophets. This means that all the teachings of all the prophets and the religion of all the prophets was what? It was Islam. As Allah says, in the deen, in the Islam, the religion from Hazrat Adam salam, to Prophet salam, has always been Islam. And the teachings and the articles of faith have always been the same. And uh, here again, we see that the order of Salah and Zakat together, and uh, it has been together, Salah and Zakat, they have been ordered 70 times in Quran. And the two parts of this verse, two parts and two um, words of this verse are basically ordering about the congregational salah for the Muslim men. The order of the congregational salah being obligatory for the Muslim men is being proven by two parts of this verse. The two parts of this verse are making the congregational salah obligatory for the Muslim men. The two parts are Number one is Akimu Salata, the words of Akimu Salata, and the second was of Varqa'u Ma'arwaqi'in. Akimu Salata means the establishing of prayer. As I discussed in detail in the chapter number one, means the order of congregational salah, and it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the term Akimu Salata means what? That the congregational prayer is obligatory for the Muslim men. And when in Allah, in this verse, Allah is saying that make raku. How? Alone? Single? Soul? No. O Muslim men, make raku in the company of those who are making raku of the salah. So this itself is making the congregational salah obligatory for the Muslim men. So I will be repeating the words of Prophet Sallallahu again, as Prophet Sallallahu said that um, the narrator says 
that Azan had been called out and Akama had also been recited, that Prophet said that I intended to appoint someone else instead of me to lead the Salah and to act as the Imam. And I myself wanted to go and set fire to the house in which men were not coming to join the congregational Salah, despite the fact that they had no excuse. And the Prophet also added that if it had not been it had not been because of my concern for the children and for the women and for the old and for the sick, I would have set fire to the houses in which men were not joining the congregational salah because despite of the fact that they did not have any excuse. Now, I would here want to mention why congregational salah is so important and what are the advantages and what does it train the Muslims for? It is, it is an essential method of training the Muslim men for so many important things. It teaches punctuality. Five times a day with full punctuality of the time of the Salah, the men reaching the mosque in time, they learn punctuality. The second thing is time management. Another thing is discipline and organization. It trains them to make a cue, make them lines. And then this congregational salah, they teach the Muslims unity, brotherhood, fraternity, the concept of equality. Eradicates all forms of prejudices of color, of caste, of creed, of family. As Prophet Salavarism said, that no white has superiority over the black and no Arab has superiority over the non-Arab. You are all the sons of Adam. So this is exactly what this congregational salah teaches. And then it teaches mutual love and mutual bonding. And then it provides opportunity five times a day for all the Muslims to meet, to interact, to know each other and to find out about each other's conditions. And the mosque then would be acting as a social, a political, a judicial, a military, a financial, a trade center for so much, so many activities. It becomes a center for all those. And it is just because of the establishment of congregational salah. And Prophet ﷺ has in so many ahadiths explained the excellence of congregational salah. Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith narrated in Muslim that prayer in congregation is 27 times greater than praying alone. So this is the merit of congregational salah. And then the Companions say that they were only they were only the hypocrites in Medina who would stay away from the congregational salah. All the true companions of the Prophet Sallallahu nobody stayed be, stayed back from salah, the congregational salah. And then there was a person, a blind person, who came to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and uh, he wanted excuse and he wanted to stay behind and not come to the mosque because of his blindness. And uh, Prophet asked him if he could hear the adhan when he was at home. He said, yes. And then Prophet said, you have to respond. I cannot find any excuse for you. And as Prophet said, that whoever hears the call of the salah must respond, must respond until and unless he has an he has a valid excuse. So any person who can hear and who can walk to the mosque has to come to the congregational salah in the mosque. And this is obligatory for all the Muslim men. <coughs> Prophet Sallallahu has been reported. It has been reported by Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu that Prophet Sallallahu said, the prayers found too hard by the hypocrites are the Isha and the Fajr. And had they known the goodness that they would bring to them, they would have come crawling to join them. 
even though they had to crawl, they would come to offer the salah. So the salah of the congregation in Isha and Fajr, they are difficult to be attended. They find it difficult to attend who? The hypocrites only. And Prophet has been reported in Abu Dawood. He said that if there are three men in a village or three men in a desert and they make no arrangement for salah in congregation, then shaitan must have certainly overcome them. So if a person is not offering salah in congregation, then the person has been overcome by salah, uh, overcome by shaitan. And then Prophet has an order. So observe, observe salah in congregation for the wolf eats up a solitary sheep that stays away from the flock. So that is the importance and the merit of the congregational salah. Now, verse number 44, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ataqmuruna nasa bil birri wa tansawna anfusakum wa antum tatloon al-kitaba afala taqiloon. Do you order? Do you order the righteousness of the people and forget yourselves while you recite the scripture? Then will you not reason? Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, Allah has ordered to refrain from a behavior which is illogical, which is pointless, and which is beyond reasoning. That is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking them to advise, to teach, to educate, to orders other about righteous deeds and not to adopt or practice them ourselves. Allah is advising us that if you are teaching and ordering and advising other people about righteous deeds, then do not fail to adopt or practice all what you are teaching and educating and advising yourselves also. As Allah says in another verse of Quran, Lima tukuluna ma la taf'alun. Qabura, qabura maktan in the lahi an tukulu ma la taf'alun. Why do you say, why do you say things which you do not practice yourselves? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that on the day of judgment, there will be people People who see, they will see a person who will be running around in the base of hellfire and they will recognize him and they will ask him as to why he got to this end and why he has received this punishment. And you know what that person will say? People will ask him that why he has reached this punishment because he used to teach them about the teachings of Quran. He used to tell them about the righteous deeds. And the person will answer that I used to teach you, but I failed to practice them myself. Astaghfirullah Rabbi min kulli zambin natubu alayk. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. Prophet said, double face and double tongue, that saying something and not practicing it. Double face and double tongue on the day of judgment, he will come with two tongues of fire. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. Verse number 45. Wasta'inu bis sabri wa salah, wa innaha la kabiratun illa ala al-khashain. Seek help, seek help through patience and prayer. And indeed, it is difficult. It is what? Salah. It is difficult except for the humbly submissive to Allah. Wasta'inu bis sabri was salah. Seek help through patience and salah. Now, this part of the verse is giving two suggestions to the believers to help them in steadfastness 
on the path of Jannah and to be steadfast in the obedience of Allah. The two suggestions are patience and salah. Patience and salah have a very direct relationship and they are both very intricately related with each other. Salah helps and promotes one to be patient and patience helps us to establish Salah. So they both potentiate and they both augment each other. Because you know, if we notice, patience needs tolerance and self-control. A person can be patient if he has, if he is tolerant and if he has self-control. And Salah helps us develop this self-control. Salah in, in fact, Salah, and not only Salah, in fact, all physical worships, they train the person for self-control. During Salah, what happens? A person stops himself from many halal and many permissible things, which are basic necessities of life. So while a person is making Salah, the person stops himself from many halal, many permissible things which are necessary for him in his life, like eating and drinking and walking and talking, looking around. These are all normal activities of life. And these are all necessities of life. And these are all very, very much permissible. But during Salah, out of fear of Allah, out of love of Allah, out of desire to obey Allah, desire to stop from the disobedience of Allah, the person in Salah controls his body. He stops and controls his eyes, his ears, his tongues, his hands, his feet, all the parts of his body. And this is how Salah turns out as a means of training him for self-control. And this self-control of the person in establishing salah makes obedience to Allah and surrendering to Allah easy for a believer. And that is why Allah is saying, that there is no doubt, there, there is no doubt that it, it means what? Salah. It means here as salah. Allah says that there is absolutely no doubt that Salah is difficult. It is difficult except all people. It is difficult for all people except for those who are humble and those who submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It means that offering Salah and establishing Salah is going to be difficult for people who are not humble. Who, do not, who are not submissive and who do not surrender and submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The arrogant, the aggressively disobedient will find establishing of salah difficult. People who are God-fearing, it is easy for them to establish salah. Why? Because the God-fearing people know they know and they remember the words of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They know and they remember all the God-fearing people and all the humble and all the submissive people. They remember that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us that the first question on the day of the judgment will be about Salah, whose Salah will be according to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the remaining of the accountability will be easy. So for them who remember all this, for them, Salah is easy. It is not difficult for them to establish Salah. Allahumma hasibna hissa bi yisira. Rabbi ja'alli maqeem as-salati wa min suriyati. Verse number 46. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues about the Hoshra'een and says, who are the Hoshra'een? Allazina yazunnuna annahum mulaqu rabbihim. 
وَأَنَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Who are the Hoshayin? Who are certainly that they will meet their Lord and that they will return to him. So now in verse 46, Allah continues what Allah is explaining in the previous verse. In the previous verse, Allah said that Salah is easy for people who are humble, who are submissive, and who are the Hoshayin. So now in this verse, continuing the discussion, Allah explains who are the Hoshayin, who are the people who are God-fearing. And in this verse 46, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to explain us the traits, the behavior, and the mannerism of Hoshayin so that we can relate and we can check for ourselves that do we come up to the merit of Hashain or not? So who the Hashain are? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, number one, Hashain are the people who know and who realize and who remember that they have to meet, they have to face, and they have to return towards their sustainer. That is Hashain are those who are who are God-fearing, who fear hereafter. And Hashain are those who know and who remember that they are going to be asked about the establishment of Salah on the day of judgment. And for them, then Salah will become very easy and would, it would become very convenient to establish Salah. The second point and the second thing is that Hashain are those who assume and those who think that Salah itself is a training, it is a reminder for the day of judgment, for the time when they're going to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hasha'in themselves, they realize that offering Salah five times a day, offering Salah five times a day, we are actually practicing we are actually relieving, receiving training. Actually, it is a reminder that we are going to stand. We are going to stand. The way we stand in our salah, in a similar manner, there, was, there is going to be a day when we are going to stand in a similar manner in front of our rub. We are going to face and we are going to meet Malik Yawm al And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Rahman, وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَانِ That a person who fears to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, there will be the Jannah. And the third thing which the traits and the behavior and the mannerism of Hashra'in this verse explains is, that Hashra'in are those who assume Salah as a meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hashra'in are those who think, who assume that Salah is what? It is actually a meeting of the bondsmen with Allah. So for all those who offer Salah with this frame of mind, who offer Salah with this frame of mind that is it is a meeting with their creator, with their rub, with their sustainer, then salah becomes easy. It becomes enjoyable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the gift of his meeting on the night of a session. We know, Anna? we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa with the gift of his meeting on the night of a session. And on the night, Allah made the five prayers obligatory also. So we can relate with it like this, that Allah had a meeting, actual meeting with the Prophet Sallallahu and gifted the Ummah with Salah, which itself is a meeting of Allah with his bondsmen. And if you realize how easy is the meeting of a person with Allah, the meeting 
of a person with the master of masters, the meeting of a person with the ruler of rulers, it is so very extremely easy. And if we compare, it is so difficult to meet the rulers of the world, the masters of the world, how difficult it is to meet the prime minister, the president, the chief minister, the, govern the governor. We have to take appointments, a waiting in period, and then after delayed appointments and after a long waiting period, there is a short and there is a formal meeting, a protocol meeting, and that is it. But imagine, imagine Salah, meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so, so easy, so convenient. All we need to do is what? To purify ourselves, to make wudu, to stand facing the qibla, wear a satr libas and stand facing the qibla, raise hands and state takbir, and the meeting and conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts. And then we can talk to him. We can talk our, we can talk out our heart to him, narrate our worries, our stresses, explain, explain and narrate our desires, our needs. Innama ashku basi wa huzni ilallah. Seems as if salah, it just seems to me as if salah is a hotline. It is just a hotline, a direct, a direct dialing to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So easy, so convenient, so pleasurable, so reassuring, so relaxing, and so, so much more. When Prophet sallallahu was asked, what is Ahsan, man Ahsan? He said, Ahsan is that you offer salah as if you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you see your creator. And if this is not possible for you, if it's, it is not so for you, then you at least offer salah as if he is seeing and watching you. A companion of the Prophet sallallahu said, when I want to talk and converse to Allah, I offer salah. And when I want, that my creator, my Allah talks to me, I recite Quran. So this is Salah. It is a meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all those, believe me, all those who develop this state of mind and frame of mind, for them, Salah becomes extremely easy. Salah has a direct, direct relationship with Sabr with patience. For those whom salah becomes easy, for them, patience and sabr, endurance in the obedience and the path of Allah becomes easy and convenient also. For this, to understand and comprehend this, I would want you to narrate the story of Hazrat Bilal radiallahu ta'ala and who. He was one of the point years to embrace Islam. He was a slave. He was a black slave. And he turned out to be the point years to in, embrace Islam. How severely he was tortured after he accepted in Islam and after he converted as a Muslim, his master used to torture him. He was tortured, he was persecuted. He was punished because of his conversion. His master used to beat him. He used to beat him. He used to lash him. And when the master used to get tired, he used to chain him up. And after chaining him up, he used to hand him over to young boys. And these boys used to drag him in the streets of Mecca. And when the boys used to get tired, they used to bring him back to the master and then the master used to make him lie on the hot sand of the desert in the scorching blazing sun he used to be he used to be he used to make him lie down with his back on the hot sizzling sand of the desert land and then he used to place a huge stone on his chest so that he could not move 
And seeing all these, all these persecutions, the companions used to ask Hazrat Bilal radiallahu ta'ala and who, that how could he stand all that? And you know what he used to comment? He used to say, my brothers, when you go to a marketplace and when you buy a pot of porcelain, then don't you knock it, don't you strike it to check whether it is cracked or not. So you know what? My rub, my sustainer is trying to pick me out, is trying to choose me. So he's just trying to strike me and he's just putting me to trial to judge my purity and sincerity of my belief and iman. Subhanallah, what patience, what endurance. How remarkably steadfast was he in the path of Jannah? How did he achieve this level of patience? You know what? In Bukhari, Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala narrates an incident. He explained that one morning after Fajr prayer, Prophet Sallallahu stopped and he put his hand on Hazrat Bilal's shoulder and he stopped him and he asked him, Bilal, which deed of yours, for which deed of yours do you expect the most reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The question of Prophet Sallallahu I repeat, that he asked Hazrat Bilal radiallahu ta'ala and who that from all amongst from all the deeds he was doing, for which did he expect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him the maximum reward? And then Prophet added, because you know what? Today, Bilal, today I heard the sound of your footsteps ahead of mine in Jannah. Subhanallah, this is Bilal Khabushi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This is the merit of the companions of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That is why we call them the an'amta alayhim. Hazrat Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, there is one deed which I perform, which I perform with perseverance and with regularity. And what is that? That whenever, whenever I perform wudu, I offer some salah according to my capacity. This is what? This is the hayatul wudu. So if you compare and contrast, today people find it hard, find it difficult to perform wudu and to offer and establish salah even the obligatory salah, people find it difficult. But for Hazrat Bilal radiallahu ta'ala and who, even the tahayyatul wudu was so light and was so easy. So what do we gather? What we need to gather is that for Hazrat Bilal, for whom salah was so light, was so easy, was so convenient, was so enjoyable, even the even the supererogatory salah of the Hayatul Wuzu was so light and easy for him. And he was so persistent in establishing this supererogatory salah for him. Then the hardships and the obedience of Allah were also easy. The heavy stones, the heavy stone slates were as light as flowers for him because salah was light for him because salah was easy and convenient for him. Allahumma ja'alni sabura wa ja'alni shakura. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Rabbi ja'alni maqim as-salati wa min zurriyati. Rabbana, Rabbana la tuzi' qulubana ba'da ishadaytana wa hablana milatun ka rahma innaka anta al-wahab. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستقبلك ونتوب إليك
سبحان ربك رب العزة يما يسفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين سمامين